I'm Dr. Les Lynette, and I hope to help you understand psychiatric problems. Courts, attorneys, police, social workers, therapists, and friends often assume that what the presumably frightened, alienating parent is saying is true, because the kinds of abuse the alienator claims do happen. There are ex-spouses who are abusive and sexual molesters. The alienating parent can be very convincing with detailed, vivid stories. The clincher is that the alienated child corroborates the alienating parent's version. Normal, decent, innocent bystanders often side with the alienating parent. Unfortunately, many therapists don't realize the severity and depth of the problem. In fact, they may testify in court in favor of the alienating parent. Dramatic allegations from the alienating parent are often acted upon without an investigation. Agencies may remove the targeted parent from the children and in so doing allow the alienating parent additional time to proceed with alienation. The people entrusted with protecting children may contribute to an ongoing child abuse. Courts need a sophisticated mental health professional to identify parental alienation syndrome. These cases are among the hardest cases to decide. Judges have also been slow to place serious sanctions on alienating parents without the threat of fines, jail time, or granting sole custody to the targeted parent. Why should the alienating parent stop? The most severe cases of abuse of a child's emotions will leave scars and lost opportunities for normal development. The child is also at risk of growing up and being an alienator, since the alienating parent has been the primary role model. It's probably the best book on the subject, and one that no one has read because it's distributed by the American Bar Association instead of Barnes and Noble, is Children Held Hostage. And unfortunately, the book concludes by saying that the judges do not want to know about this. Unfortunately, usually the targeted parent is ordered to go to supervised visitation, which is a whole other nightmare. And we are back, and joining me now is Ross Peterson. A fairly amicable uh, situation where we were sharing custody and working together all of a sudden stopped dead in its tracks, and all sorts of false claims were made against me. You uh, partly blame the attorney for that? You feel that the attorney's... Well, I believe, up some stuff. Uh, oh, absolutely. Um, we were making great progress. In fact, I thought we were going to uh, resolve something really, really quickly. And then all of a sudden, a, a different attorney was put uh, on the scene, and immediately things changed drastically. All of a sudden, there were claims that I had embezzled money from marital funds. There were, there were claims that they found pornography on the family computer. Um, the list of things went on and on, and I found myself... Uh, you know, eventually being accused of sexually molesting my child. Um, I went uh, and had a polygraph. I also went as far as having a sexual abuse uh, psychologist review me. Um, at the end of those two reviews, they basically said that they don't believe that that indeed happened, but yet the claims continued, and eventually I lost uh, my visitation with my son. I was not able to see him for nearly nine months. Now um, I have supervised visitation. I am paying uh, to see my son eight hours a week. Um, I'm not allowed to speak to him about the case. He can't talk to me. Um, your condo was stormed by the police on one occasion. One night uh, there was a knock on the door about 9.15 at night. Six policemen stormed into my condo, uh, all of which had weapons. They made me sit in a chair for nearly two and a half, almost three hours. I was not allowed to make a phone call because there were no charges. They took my computer uh, they took any type of storage media that they could find that would be CDs, that would be flashcards. They took my camera. They took anything that, that might have child pornography on it. They were basically told the man will have child pornography at his house. Um, they left. Uh, my computer was taken and kept in the Wisconsin uh, crime lab for nearly two months. I had to go out and buy another computer. I wasn't able to work for a period of time, and it was returned to me. I really didn't get a formal, uh, I'm sorry, just basically we're doing our job. 
And, so, uh, and, and nothing was found. There was the claim is the problem. It, it puts a cloud over your head. I mean, you think it from the, the kid's point of view. I'm going to go through this for four years because he's been interviewed multiple times as well. As a matter of fact, uh, my son was actually taken to two hospitals um, and they videotaped him and they did uh, different examinations because, of course, these claims that have been made, uh, you know, they wanted to see if they thought he was being abused. And the reality is there's no indication of that whatsoever. And you think that there should be sanctions against the party in a divorce that makes false second? Well, I think that there's a real problem. I don't think that the people are making the accusations are accountable. All they have to do is make a claim. And we do have laws that state it's against the California Penal Code section to commit perjury. Uh, it's against the California Penal Code section to lie to officers during an investigation. There are laws in place that should prevent these types of actions, but there is no enforcement, and that's what we're seeing. What we tell people to do is after you have faced a second allegation that's proven to be false, then you need to bring some sort of court action outside the family law court action, do a small claims court action, uh, bring a lawsuit against them, proving that there's been, there has been more than one situation, and, you know, give some sort of financial penalty to abusing the court system, abusing the social services system, abusing the police department, and abusing the entire process, and, um, you know, rescuing, because the courts aren't doing it. The kind of cases that I see in the worst case scenario is that there is somebody that's really disturbed to be able to behave in such atrocious ways and it's just heartbreaking. I mean, people, people say that they have this hole in their heart and I'm very concerned that a lot of these people don't win their cases. They do lose their children. They do lose their financial resources. They do lose their self-esteem. The amount of loss is overwhelming and then they just get kicked to the curb. I don't see that anybody is doing anything to help these people take people with any kind of a loss and help heal the, the, the emotional weight of it. And then once it's healed, you, it isn't that you forget it. It's that it no longer has that terrible pull, that awfulness to it. Many of these cases are not resolvable in court. Courts are relying on people be, being law-abiding. And the people in the severe category are not law-abiding, they're anarchists. Well, one thing, when we were talking the other day, you told me that therapy doesn't work. You said that like, a lot of times the courts want to send people to therapy. I think that what's really overlooked is the reason that therapy doesn't work is that there are personality disorders that are the cause of that kind of behavior. And the courts don't understand the depth and breadth of that problem. And many psychologists don't. And furthermore, they don't want to label it. They don't want to label a narcissist or a borderline or a histrionic or a sociopath. But all of the people that engage in behavior where it's win by domination and uh, they have no conscience, no pity, no sympathy, no empathy, no compassion, those are not normal people. The disturbed people that would do this kind of thing are both men and women. And it's very important to not get into gender wars about women against men and, and vice versa, because that really is taking us off track. The reason why therapy and a lot of other measures don't work is because the system itself doesn't give consequences for actions, reward for good behaviors, prioritizing the child over the aggression of, between the parents, violation of court orders. Most of the time, most of the judges in most of the courtrooms do not give violations of court orders. So what happens is the parent who's out of control, the parent who is most willing to act in their own benefit over the child's benefit to win is actually rewarded uh, through the actions of the system who said, oh, because that child no longer has a relationship with that parent, then we're going to give very little visitation with the parent. So again, they're rewarding the parent for playing dirty. Now don't go away. You can see a preview of my entire playlist. Click here and after clicking here you will be taken to my channel where you may select the playlist either for this channel or for any of my other playlists of possible interest to you. I hope to see you on YouTube. Bye.